volatile markets and capital flows, significant economic transitions, financial tightening in many economies, the large drop in commodity prices, including oil, and escalated geopolitical conflicts. So what should be Asia's response? Well, some of the broad principles are well known. Supportive monetary policy, consistent with price and external stability objectives, one of which has been clearly identified by India back in February 2015. In India, enhancing the efficiency of product markets, encouraging private investment, improving infrastructure and banks' balance sheets. In many countries, from emerging to low income, strengthening the business environment and developing bond markets. Successfully dealing with these kinds of structural issues will not only support Asia's near and medium term prospects, but it also will secure the foundations in order to help the region unleash its full potential. Across the region, income inequality has worsened since 1990. We just recently published a study that concludes that income inequality has increased in 15 of the 22 Asian economies since 1990. And Asia remains home to two-thirds of the world's poor, many of whom live in this country. In most of the region, women and young people are still finding it difficult to access the job market. Now, if we look at it from another perspective, what sounds daunting can actually be also analyzed as significant opportunities. Because what about if income inequality could be reversed, if poverty could continue to be reduced, if women were empowered, and if growth was, growth was made more inclusive and more sustainable? What if Asia's 4.4 billion people could actually unleash their full potential? Let me suggest six ideas that could actually help turn what seems daunting into opportunities. First of all, broadening access to services like health and finance. India, for example, is targeting universal access to banking services by 2018, as you had explained to me, Mr. Prime Minister. And through the, forgive the pronunciation, Pradhan Mantri Yandan Yoyana scheme, over 210 million previously unbanked people have now opened a bank account since August 2014 with social transfers paid directly. Second, leveraging the impact of fiscal policy. And that means targeting the social spending on those who need it most. Countries such as the Philippines, for instance, have pioneered conditional cash transfer programs. It also needs to avoid costly across-the-board subsidies and making taxes more progressive. With the Haadar system, India has come up with a groundbreaking way to deliver targeted subsidies. Almost one billion people have Haadar, Haadar numbers and the potential to use this for delivering payment and other services. And I understand that under the bill that was voted yesterday, all such transfers will have to actually be made through that Hadar system, which will be critically important for women. And this brings me to my third point. The empowering of women is essential, whether by enhancing girls' access to high-quality education, dismantling legal and logistical barriers to economic participation, or making simply women's life when they go to work a little bit easier. An initiative of Prime Minister Modi's government, for example, is to improve women's wealth services under Betty Bachao, Betty Padao, very importantly, inaugurating the first ever new regional training and technical assistance center for South Asia. This is the first time that we're actually bringing together technical assistance and training into one single hub that will serve many other countries in the region.